Well, it wouldn't be live uh, without technical difficulties. So um, we are now yep. here now that we've gone through all of that. Um, it is lovely to have you, Arnau. Uh, it's seven o'clock for me in the lovely New yep. Zealand. Where are you calling from? Mm -hmm. I am from Barcelona and it's also 7 p.m. right now. I think we're 12 hours ahead and thank you so much for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks Thanks for coming on. Um, tell me a little bit about what you do. Um, you have a uh, YouTube channel, uh, obviously, um, talking mm -hmm. about Webflow, Figma, all of that good stuff. Um, and mm -hmm. what do you do around that? What's some other stuff that you do with that? Yeah, so I'm actually a freelance, a remote freelance product designer. Right? That's my like official, official title there. Uh, I started a YouTube channel basically to help me get my name out there in the world of design and honestly just to connect with some with some other designers around the world and really just to sort of learn a little bit more about what it takes to be a, <laughs> a good designer and to also teach people um, some design skills. And I started my YouTube channel around almost two years ago now and it's been a great, great journey so far. Um, the channel almost has around like 270,000 views or something, which is, which is really great. I mean, I know there's, there's, mis there's the Mr. Beasts out there in the world, but so far the channel is doing great and it's been, a, it's been a great journey so far. Yeah, totally. Well, tell me about the, uh, the journey of starting that channel so straight from mm -hmm. uh, the first video, uh, what it looked like to, um, first of all, why did you start making videos and what was it like to create mm -hmm. and post that first video? Yeah, so I've always wanted to to start a YouTube channel, right? I've always been one of those guys where I was like, oh, what if, you know, what if I actually did it? And then I was always too introverted to never really do it. Um, I, I guess I'm, I am a pretty introverted kind of guy. Uh, but I remember seeing, I bought into one of the Rancigal courses, one of the Flux courses. And in there, he has one of the, one of the modules where it's like, okay, like growth and ex explore all these different options. And one of these options was... Um, lead generation, right? You want to generate leads for, your, for yourself. And one of them was, okay, you can start a social media like Instagram, like TikTok, like YouTube or whatever. And I was like, hey, you know, I've always wanted to do YouTube. Why don't I do it now? Like this is, it's now or never, you know? And so then I sat down in my parents' house during, during lockdown and I said, I said, fuck it. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it. I, I bought a, like a, like a terrible little mic and I recorded from my phone. And yeah, man, I made the channel and around like eight months later or something like that, I finally recorded my first video just because I was so like scared of it. And I was so like, oh my God, what if someone watches me that I know? What if, what if these people know what I'm doing, you know? <laughs> and I finally did it. I did the video, as you can see, on how to make uh, freelance contracts and how I used a, a certain software to do it and all these technical things about it. But it was, it was the only thing that I really knew how to do at the time and the only thing I felt like the easiest, most comfortable thing I could do is, okay, I do this all the time, I can just talk about it. It'll take me like 10, 20 minutes and whatever. But at the end, the result is a five minute video where I'm super nervous, <laughs> super introverted in that video. And obviously now I'm, I'm a lot more comfortable. Two years later, I'm, I'm doing a lot better. But yeah, <laughs> that's that's how I first got started and, and yeah. Definitely. And when you first started, did you straight away start doing one video a week uh, or did you kind of slowly ease into doing that? Yeah, man. When the, one of the reasons why I struggled so much with starting was because I knew that, okay, if I start this, I'm going to do it until the end, right? I'm going to, I'm going to go at it a hundred percent because that's, that's kind of the way my brain works. Either I do it a hundred percent or I don't do it at all. So for, since I started, I don't, I don't know how long ago that was, maybe like a year and eight months, nine months, something like that. Um, it'll be two years in August, August 31st when I first uh, published. But yeah, I did consistently. I haven't skipped a single week. Every single week, I post a video on Webflow, on freelancing, on Figma a lot of the time. This Figma does tremendously well. And it's been super consistent and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, and talking about, uh, you know, what this has done for you um, as a designer, you know, getting work in general um, and also just mm -hmm. having like being able to start conversations with people who are commenting and stuff. Uh, what does that look like? How often do uh, people reach out to you and, and you get to actually chat to people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, one of the one of the benefits of 
of doing this consistently, like I've like I've done right for for this this amount of time, is that sooner or later someone is going to see you, and that someone, hopefully, they like who you are as as a person, right? That's that's part of the reason why you want to get yourself out there, because in terms of quality of work, like people will be will be better or worse than than you, right? But at some point, the level the level like the level playing field levels out, right? Like if you won one award, if you won the other one, if you won this, if you won that, everybody's work is tremendous at the top, right? And what sets people aside from each other is their personality. And it's it's the way that mm. you communicate and the way that you are with, with potential clients and with, with potential friends and and building this, this community of, of designers and, and clients. I mean, the, the whole reason why, why you want to start this is so that you can start these these relationships and, and build these bridges. And one of the benefits that, that I found was whenever I started my certain type of video, like whether it was about uh, freelancing, or whether it was about Webflow, whether it was about this, I attracted a different type of person to the channel, right? So when I first started sharing about how to make a freelance contract, it, it, it attracted a certain type of beginner freelancer. And then when I mm. started making videos about like complex Webflow animations, it attracted a completely different type of, of audience, right? One of the things that that I used with that, like one of the one of the strategies there, was I started making videos about. I don't remember if it was um, Figma design kits or something along the lines of that. But mm. I, I had a client reach out to me, or just I had someone reach out to me who ended up being a really great long-term freelance client, and that's the client I'm still working for to this day. So starting a YouTube channel allowed me to to sort of build my my portfolio. It started me. It, it allowed me to to get this freelance opportunity where I'm at now. And it's it's honestly been been up from here. You know, it's been it's been absolutely great to to make those first connections with people. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, what one thing I was gonna ask is about uh, uh, was about kind of uh, niching or picking an audience or making content for certain people. But before I talk about that, there are a lot of different platforms that people can actually share their work, mm -hmm. make videos and, and share ideas on. Uh, obviously, you've done YouTube, I've done YouTube, um, and you're on a couple mm -hmm. of other platforms. But in terms of uh, owning a platform uh, and really you know, creating great content off of that, how do you pick mm -hmm. uh, the right platform, whether it be Instagram, YouTube, uh, doing podcasts at an entirely different, uh, separate mm -hmm. uh, can of worms? Yeah. Yeah. I think, honestly, I feel like it, it depends on, on the person that you are, you know? One, one way I would I would pick it is what do you spend the most time on? You know, I spent all my time on YouTube <laughs> watching Mr. Beast, watching MKBHD, watching whoever it is, right? And I said, well, you know, I see myself doing this. I don't see myself on TikTok, for example. I don't see myself yeah. creating reels because I think it's just a different type of, of environment. I think the way that I am as a person is is more, I don't know, more more slow, more less like, this is how you do this, this is how you do this, this is how you do this, you know, which is the type of content that you need to be making on platforms like TikTok and, and exactly. Instagram, which I have tried, right? I, I've, I have, my, have my, my, my few reels and my few TikToks, but I don't know, man. I think to, to make the, to be consistent, which is all it is in this game, and to be, to be, to be the person to go for, for that niche on that platform, you need to be consistent, right? And that for me was just Webflow, I mean Webflow, was YouTube, right? Like I'm always watching YouTube, I'm always on YouTube, and I said, I can I can do this. Why why not? You know, why Yeah, exactly. Yep, definitely. And and what about for people so if people are trying to uh, start this kind of stuff, what about for people who don't like their voice or don't like themselves on video? <laughs> I feel like that's a fear yeah. for a lot of people. It was a fear for me when I first started out. How can you kind of trump that fear, get over that? Yeah, honestly, I still watch myself on on screen, and and I am like, oh god, is that, is that what I sound like? Is that what I look like? And I feel like I don't know if that ever goes away. You know, I don't know if if the more you do it, the 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 less you care. But I mean, that's definitely the case with me. Like I, when I first started, I remember just doing test footage on my phone, and I was like, oh god, I don't want to, I don't want to look like this. <laughs> I don't want to sound like this in front of the camera. But I think it's it's more just about being being natural and sooner or later like you'll, you'll get used to it it's just your face you know it's just your voice and 
Uh, you're also just, you're probably just being dramatic, right? At the end of the day, <laughs> you probably sound fine. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Uh, we have mm -hmm. a, a question. Uh, what was the learning curve for YouTube in terms of filming, editing? Uh, was it too big? And did you initially have any experience uh, before starting YouTube? Yeah, so initially, I the only editing experience or the only like web, you know, web, the only video experience I had was doing editing for like school projects, right? When I was when I was a kid, <laughs> that was the only editing experience I had. And I think a, a lot of the, the learning curve was, was tremendous, right? I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to make thumbnails. I didn't know how to, how to present myself in front of a camera. I was super shy in front of the camera. I was, my voice was shaking. I didn't know how to do it. And one of the things is that more, the more you watch YouTube, the more you understand things. And especially if you're sitting down and you're trying to pick apart, why did Casey Neistat only show his face for three seconds instead of five? Why did this happen instead of this. You know, you watch a Logan Paul podcast or a Logan Paul video or whatever, and you try to dissect every minute and every second, and you start to understand the reasons behind things and why, you know, this was shot in a certain way. And the, the learning curve is massive. I mean, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, all that really matters is that you are publishing, and all that really matters is that you're putting yourself out there. Your, your first video, I mean, this is a common thing to say, but it's so true, like your first video, is going to be crap. Like your second video is going to be crap. Your third, your fourth, your fifth, but then your your 80th video might not be too bad. You know, so it'll be it'll be watchable. Someone will will watch it, and that just that comes with time. That comes with effort. I mean, if you look at my my notion, um, my like my management system for YouTube, there's hundreds of pages, just like thumbnail, um, like take aparts and the best thing to put in your bio, the best thing to to start with, the best thing to end your videos, like. It's endless. Like there's so many things to to look into, and that's why, back to your previous question, like it's so hard to do that to to do one platform well. It's even harder to do two platforms, let alone three. Yeah. You know, like you make a YouTube channel, it's one thing, but then you take those same the same knowledge that you that you gain from from watching all these videos and these tutorials, and then you bring it to Instagram, and you'll get zero views because it's it's a it's a different metric, it's a different it's a different algorithm. Like it's just completely different. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that point um, should be emphasized because I always think about, you know, the stuff that I make on YouTube, what can I kind of reuse for Instagram? But you really do have mm -hmm. to make a completely different kind of content. And so you have to decide that is this the kind of content that I want to continue making uh, on a regular mm -hmm. basis? Um, and yeah. there's someone local that I um, that I know that has 150,000 followers on Instagram because he posts mm -hmm. helpful like tutorials and content several times a week. Um, and it's because he, you know, enjoys doing it enough to keep doing it on a regular basis. And it's actually, uh, it's helpful content, but it's very mm -hmm. different to what you would uh, post on YouTube. to what you would say on Twitter, it's uh, a very specific format for Instagram. Yeah, every, every platform is extremely specific to, to its own metrics, right? Yeah. If you're if you're if you're trying to be successful on Twitter, and your thing is is speaking and being vocal, well then maybe Twitter's not <laughs> maybe Twitter's not the way to go. You know maybe you should do Instagram Reels or maybe you should do Instagram Lives and maybe you should do YouTube Lives and podcasts. And that's that's one of the reasons why I started my own podcast is because even though as I said I'm an introverted person, I love speaking to people and I love and I love connecting with people and 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 especially with design and talking about design all the time. So it's really about pick the platform that you think is best for you and just stick to it, just be consistent. And that being said, it doesn't only need to be YouTube or Instagram. You know, there's mm. be consistent on Dribbble, be consistent on Behance, be consistent yeah. on Pinterest, be the, the biggest Pinterest designer. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> there's so many platforms out there that, that you can use to, to grow and to, to gain knowledge and to get jobs and there's so many different avenues to go down not just these these two which are the most popular yep definitely um there are plenty of great questions in the chat i'm gonna to get to that in just a second um let's but do it I, first mm -hmm. i want to ask uh what work should i share so the kind of stuff that i share how do i think of new ideas uh in terms of stuff mm -hmm. to share what's the kind of stuff that i should be sharing yeah well it's it's twofold because on one side you want to make content that will get views and that will get you subscribers. But on the other side, 
if you if you make videos to get jobs and to get hired, well then you might post like a case study, or you might post a a deep dive into the UX of a platform, something like that. But then that might not get views, right? So it's it's about balancing yeah. the two, where you want to showcase your expertise in a subject while still being entertaining, while still being funny, while still being whatever whatever like your niche is. You know, you still want to make content for both streams, and that's that's a very thin line to go down because you can very easily go like the tutorial route, and you say, well, there's nothing wrong with that, right? But it's very easy to go down that way and not go down the get clients route, and that's mm. that's kind of what you're balancing all the time, especially if you do it to get jobs and to land clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to pop to the chat. Um, I think this first one is super interesting and I, I don't know how Let's I think about this. What are your thoughts on creating web flow, no code content or just content in general in regional <laughs> languages and will it impact business the same as creating uh, in English? What are your thoughts on that? I think that's a great question. <laughs> I think if you create content in, in the language, first of all, the one that you're more comfortable in, and second of all, if there's a market for that language, then absolutely you should definitely go down because one, the market might be oversaturated, but that's necessarily a bad thing as well, but the market might be oversaturated with, with designers who speak in English. I just saw a, a Slack channel for, for Webflow designers who only speak Spanish. And maybe there's a, there's a Webflow niche for people who only speak Portuguese or people who only speak German. And I know there's a great Webflow designer out there who only speaks German or only makes content in German. And I think that's super, super smart because then you're the local guy for Webflow. You're the local guy for Wix, for Figma, for this, for that. And I think that's that's even a very smart way to do it because mm. you'll never outgrow your country. I mean, if you're the guy for Webflow in Spain or the guy for Webflow in Germany, well, then you're set. <laughs> you know, that's not a bad thing. It's, it's a great thing. And especially if, if the niche makes sense and if there's, if there's enough people to do it, then I would say absolutely go for it. Cool, cool, awesome. Uh, what equipment did you start with? And then maybe we can get into what you slowly upgraded over time. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I watched a, a Ali Abdal, if you guys don't know him, he's a great productivity YouTuber. I watched a video of his on how to get started with YouTube. It was like the basically the, the entire topic of the video. And he basically sat down and I was like, oh, this sounds great. It looks great. I wonder what he's on. And he was recording with a, a $40 microphone that he got from, from, from Amazon or whatever. And he was just recording with his phone. And he had an app called Filmic Pro, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And that's exactly what I did. I, got, I went on Amazon and I bought a, a mic that I could connect to my phone and I paid $10 for a a video recording app that would allow me to be able to control my zoom and my focus and my my little levels you know and that's just how i got started i mean it's, it's not the best way to do it it's it's kind of janky but i mean this phone <laughs> records better than 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 anything and i also don't recommend you going out and spending a thousand dollars on a camera before you've made a video because then what if you don't like it <laughs> you know that's also an option what if it's just not for you. What if you don't enjoy it? Then you've spent a thousand dollars. You have a camera, but I mean, maybe that's an, another topic for another time. Yeah, definitely. And again, like all of that is catered around video content. So basically, talking YouTube, mm -hmm. um, but even like TikTok, a lot of that is a lot more casual. So even a phone is fine. Exactly. Um, and then again, like growth on Instagram, you don't need any of this stuff. You don't even need need a good microphone, and that's a completely uh, reasonable and different way to, to grow using mm -hmm. a platform like Instagram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's uh, get another one. At what stage did I've done that one? Or have we? Uh, yeah. At what stage, when you were creating content and sharing your work, did you start getting uh, inbound inquiries uh, from that? So yeah, how long did it take to kind of get clients um, through mm -hmm. uh, those streams? Instantly, the very first video. No, of course not. <laughs> of course not. It took it took super long. It was I think it was it took me almost like six months for me to get thirty subs from from zero to thirty subscribers. It took me like six months. So that that growth was was just I, I'm doing this, but it was more a flat than anything, right? It took me yeah. super long, and the the I wish I remembered exactly when it was what video it was, but I think it took me around a year year and a half of consistent uploading, not a year and a half, what am I saying? 
like a year of consistent uploading before I got any real traction before, before I got people wanting to do, want, wanting me to do work for them before sponsorships started appearing in my inboxes. You know, it took around 70, not 70, around, what is it? 50 videos being consistent every single week, sitting down recording before anything started to happen. And I feel like that's, that's a pretty common thing that you're going to hear throughout many YouTubers. And I don't know, I mean, I'd love to hear your, your opinion as well, but it takes a long, long time before you get any recognition and it sucks. But then once you've done the work, it's there forever, you know? Yeah, definitely. I think um, because now I get it, obviously a lot of leads through it. Um, if someone like doesn't have any leads uh, and they're wanting them straight away, then mm -hmm. um, they got to keep in mind that this kind of sharing is a long game. But in the long game, it's extremely beneficial. Um, yeah. But in the short game, um, obviously, you started on, I think it was Upwork, you said. Um, I also actually started on Upwork. Um, yeah. And so <laughs> those kind of channels to Trouble. start um, <laughs> mm -hmm. is, is a fine place to start. But then if you have that, uh, and then when you're actually sending your portfolio over or reaching out to people, having this stuff where people can actually see you, like see you talk about the exactly. same kind of topics, uh, it helps kind mm -hmm. of show that you're an, an authority figure um, and someone that it makes mm -hmm. sense to actually work with. Uh, yeah, yep. do, you, do you agree with that? I, dude, I completely agree. I mean, it's, it's what I said earlier, right? Like there's, there's thousands of, of designers, there's hundreds of Webflow designers, and then there's so, so many <laughs> Webflow designers that are already amazing. And the only thing that's gonna make you different from them is your personality because if the work yeah. is the same it's more or less on par like everybody can wake up and make a website these days it's it's who you are it's what you're bringing that's extra right it's it's your personality and it's what you said if if it's a long game then then sure i mean if it if what it takes for me to to have a consistent client base come in and, and always want always wanting websites and always asking is for me to sit down and record a video about figma about webflow then i mean that's just what i'm gonna do you know it, it takes time it takes patience but but I think it makes sense. I mean, I think, I think it's worth it in the end. That's that's just that's just my opinion on that. Yep, definitely. Uh, one more from the chat. Um, it's too high now. Sorry, Omkar. All right. So, um, uh, are do you have any educational background in UI UX, or are you a self-taught designer? Man, there are a lot of self-taught designers uh, out there who are just doing great work. But um, yeah, did you have mm -hmm. specific UI UX? Um, Mm -hmm. kind of learnings or are you just yeah no so i went to university for industrial design which is still design nonetheless it, it definitely taught me how to think in the in the ux standpoint of of customer first client first but in terms of ui ux definitely not i mean i just sat down i bought sketch or back when people used to use sketch and I was just trying to do apps, app designs, and I was trying to do web designs, and I was trying—I was just trying so many different things. I mean, I—I I first started on Photoshop when I was like 12 years old, and or like 11, 12 years old, and I was just working on a, on like a a bootlegged version of, of Photoshop, like Photoshop 6.0 or something, and I was just learning how to draw lines and how to do this and how to do that. But to get to your question. I'm definitely self-taught in the UI UX world. It just takes time. It's a lot of copying designs that that you want to learn how to do. It's a lot of like emulating your heroes, and in the end, you'll you'll finally get there. You'll finally end up learning how to how to get the designs that you've always seen and you've always loved. Totally, cool. Uh, I had a question before that I said I was going to come back to, and I'm going to come back to it now. Uh, in terms of picking an audience or niche uh, to kind of create videos around, also thinking about the kind of work that you want to get from the videos, how do you go about picking that? Yeah, so I think I think it's similar to you asking yourself, like, how do you know what to post on your portfolio, right? How do you know what projects you should post? Well, it's it's quite simple. It's do work for what you want to get hired, like publish work, publish content for what niche you want to be known in. If, if I want to be known for editor X, well, then I'd be posting videos for editor X. You know, I'd be the guy for editor X, but obviously I'm, I'm the, trying to be the guy for Webflow. I'm trying to be the guy for Figma. I'm trying to be the guy for, I don't know, whatever it is, you know, you try, you try to make the content that you want to be seen for most because 
imagine one day you make a video like this is this is this might be the worst case scenario in my mind but imagine one day i make a video about i don't know um sketch for example right and then that video just blows up it gets 300,000 views in two days whatever it is that'll be my name forever <laughs> that's that'll be what i'm known for you know that's just not that's just not what i want i want to be mm. known for for these other programs i want to be known for for delivering other other type of other type of work so at the end of the day, I would suggest that you niche down in, in the type of work that you want to be known for, because if not, then worst case scenario, you blow up and then it's for the wrong reasons, right? I mean, that's, that's just in my end, I don't know. Definitely, yeah. Um, kind of with that in terms of having this brand that, who knows, can blow up, but is, is connected to this certain uh, niche of thing, what do you think about using your name um, Obviously, you have your channel is your name, my channel is my name, and we are now yep. connected to all of our content. Like this is who we are. <laughs> yeah. Doing that versus yep. having a more generalized name uh, and building your brand around that generalized name. So Reloom or you know any example, mm -hmm. Fin Suite, uh, etc. Yep. Yeah. 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 No, I think it, I think it varies, right? Like if if I'm making a a YouTube channel or an Instagram community, whatever it is that's based around me and my work, then I'm going to call it something that I'll never get tired of and will be impossible for me to get over, it, which is your name. You're never going to get tired of your name. You're never going to get like, oh, I wish I named it something else. Like, no, it's just, that's what you're stuck with, mm. no, unless, unless you change your name. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a safe bet to go with your name. And it honestly also makes sense in terms of SEO, in terms of, of more marketing, if you want to go that way. But all right, if someone looks up your name, you want to be able to to showcase that you also have an Instagram account, you also have a YouTube account. And if maybe your name is xyz.com instead of just your name, when the, when the person tries to look up your name and sees what you've done, it'll be harder for them to find these other avenues. And th that's just the way that, that, I've, that I've gone with the channel. I mean, I've seen people also use like different names, like PewDiePie, for example, right? That his name isn't really PewDiePie. <laughs> yeah. But that's just what he used and what that's what he's known for. But if I was going to make my own product, which which I have done and which I'm doing, I definitely wouldn't call it like Arnau or Ross, um, this, that, you know, I'd, I'd give it a name. I don't know. I'd, I'd make it sound sound more more appealing. Definitely. What are your thoughts on the fact that this is kind of something that I've I think struggle with a little bit, at least the fact that because mm -hmm. your name is the brand uh, clients are coming to you, which means they basically only want to work with you. And so if you're building a brand around a specific name, mm -hmm. it's probably going to be pretty difficult to build out a, a studio and a team of people. Do you, do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely understand. I, I see the, the point of view. I recently watched a, I don't know if it was a workshop or a live stream with Chris Doe in it. Yeah. And he basically got that question, right? He was like, okay, my name grows personally but then what if i want to start an agency what if i want to start all these things and people only want to work with me they don't want to work with my employees or designers or whatever and the the answer to that is well if if they're big enough to come work for you or to come work with you right if the client has enough money to to come work with you whether it's a 30 30 thousand dollar project whatever these people understand that it's a business at the end of the day you're operating a business, you're trying to grow your business. And at the end of the day, that means outsourcing to other designers. That means putting yourself in a more of a managerial role. And I'm experiencing that right now. I mean, I'm, I'm getting inbound leads and I say, okay, cool. Um, I'll be managing this project and uh, I'll give you the email for, for these people. They're my designers, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I kind of take them through, the, through the, um, the flow. And they're like, oh, we thought we were going to work with you. You know, we really want to work with you. And the answer to that is, it's just the business, you know, it's, I'm trying to grow as well here. I'm trying to expand mm. who, who I am. I'm trying to expand the name, and I can't really do that if, if I'm working alone on 30 different projects at the same time. You know, I can't juggle that many things. And, and at the end of the day, you're going to need to outsource if you want to scale at that level, or you can just raise your prices infinitely and only take on <laughs> one per year or something. But, but yeah, at the end of the day, you're going to need to outsource. So it's, it's better to do it sooner than later as well. I recently talked with uh, Michael Janda on this. He's a superhero in, in, in agencies and freelancing. And one of the things that he said was that he regrets not outsourcing earlier because he was scared of, of losing control and he was scared of, of sort of letting go of his projects. And, mm. and that's just something you need to get over. It's something you need to do. 
because it will allow you to grow and allow you to expand your business. Totally. Yeah, very cool. Um, another really good question that I think about often when you share more technical design content, uh, don't you attract more designers? Um, and just with that, I guess, should you create uh, content that's quite broad, uh, quite simple, or should you really niche down and create content that's for a specific kind of person who's like stuck, stuck mm -hmm. with a very specific kind of problem or thinking about a specific kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the approach I've taken is the the flow of creating content is so time consuming and it's so how do i say this it's so it's so like pressing that at the end of the day i'm just creating content for what i would want to see i'm creating content for what i think is missing out there and if whether that's a very very technical webflow tutorial on how to go from figma to webflow and you need to take care of the rems you need to look at the pixels and you do this well then i feel like i'm going to enjoy that and in the end that will lead to more viewers that will lead to more designers and as a result the channel will grow which will means it'll go in front of more eyeballs which means that it'll have bigger chances of me landing a client or bigger chances of someone important seeing it and inviting me to a talk or to a podcast or whatever right at the end of the day you're just creating content that you want to do because if you don't you're, you're going to burn out it's going to be too too taxing it's going to be too too time consuming and maybe i don't know if you've experienced the same thing because i know you're doing very technical type of content you're doing very technical tutorials but yeah I'd, li I'd like to know your opinion as well yeah well well me and connor talk about this kind of quite often and i think uh i think that if you're creating more technical stuff you kind of have to know what you're talking about if people reach out with questions and you kind of have to uh be excited to help them out and not be like oh no not this one video that i only kind of understood and now i don't really know mm -hmm. how to to further like follow that up um, so I don't love going too technical. I think in general, I think, um, doing a, a more general topic, you can kind of get new audience members from that and mm -hmm. then, um, kind of get them in and do more specific ones. Once they kind of understand the basics of what you're talking about, uh, it's a, it's a fine line. It's definitely a balance. Um, yeah. so, uh, two, uh, new questions. I'm, Awesome to see uh, Sam Harrison here. I'm going to get to you in just a second. Uh, first, uh, Omkar, can you explain your entire process of creating tutorial videos? So do you write out a script for each one? Do you do an outline and just kind of go with the flow? Well, personally, I mean, it, it, it's similar to, to what I said about, you know, creating content for me is so taxing, but I enjoy it so much, right? But it just takes so much out of me. Like, it just, I pour my soul into it. So then it's just, it's so hard to do where I've gotten, I've gotten comfortable with the idea of sitting down. I have a video idea in my head and I just do it. I don't script anything. I don't I have a, an outline if, if I'm doing like, okay, the five best Webflow clonables or whatever, right? Like I have those in front of me. I have, have them right there, but I don't have an outline. I just sit down. I say what's, what's in front of me. I, I say what's in my mind. I'm, I feel like I'm very real about that. I, if, if there's something I don't like <laughs> in the clonable, for example, then I'll, I'll let people know, you know, and that's, I feel like that's one of the benefits of not having a script because I used to do that in the beginning when I was just starting and it did help me out a lot in the beginning. I would always have a script and I'd sit down and read it. But what I, what I learned is that I was just more, um, I was a bit more robotic. I was more monotone. I was, you could, you could, you could tell I was like, and then the contract is sent to like, you know, <laughs> it's so, it's so monotone, so robotic. And what I found is it's it's cliche, it's cheesy, but if you're yourself, the videos come out a lot better and they come out a lot smoother. If you learn how to be comfortable in front of the camera, they'll it'll just flow so much better. I promise you, you just need to do it a couple of times and you'll you'll need to be comfortable with it and then it'll happen. It'll finally click for you and you'll be able to to make that kind of content. Totally. Uh, I'm I'm gonna uh, ninety percent agree with you. Ten percent just disagree with you because I um, <laughs> I think about this quite a lot sometimes, and I, I think about the fact that there's obviously a lot of different kind of content on YouTube, and that ranges all the way from people who are posting daily vlogs, um, and you know it's very kind of casual and just their life. Uh, mm -hmm. and they post on a really frequent basis, and then on the very other end you have like Kirk's Kazakhs, which I'm probably saying wrong, or, or Vsauce who uh, create these uh, really like 
really well researched really heavily edited videos yeah. that take such a long time uh, and, and they don't post them very frequently and then you have somewhere in the middle where you're kind of doing kind of you know similar to what we're doing uh, we yep. have a little bit of a script outline and you kind of go off of that and all of those are great ways of making video it's just whatever you prefer so I script out all of my videos because I'm insane um, and yeah we've talked about this mm -hmm. yeah, crazy guy <laughs> can do it I <laughs> couldn't do it yeah yep. exactly and that takes more time um, but it is the kind of video content that I love making even though it's a massive pain and it takes a lot more time uh, and that's just one way of doing it, you know, and I could I could script it out even more I could add crazy animations to it. I could go uh, Even more detailed and post less frequently or I can strip it back and and post a lot more um, Kind of uh, simple stuff more often. It's just options mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree that that was one of the one of the things in the beginning where I was like, okay, either I do very very weekly consistent videos like I sit down every week or every two weeks and I do a couple of videos and I batch them or I do more like Johnny Harris style videos where it's super crafted. You can, you can yeah. see like all the love he's poured into it, all the animations, all the layers. And in the end, I, I just went down the other route, just where my life was headed. <laughs> the, the amount of time that I could allot to, to this thing, because obviously I was doing university and it was in the middle of a degree. So I didn't have time to, to sort of do a huge video every two weeks or every month or whatever it was. And I just decided to go more of a more of a weekly basis. But that being said, I do one of the one of the like the loves that, that I want to portray in my channel, maybe in the future, is doing more of a like a research and more essay video type of type of content where I I explore the the design of of the the Logitech mouse and I go through the history mm. and I don't know, I, I do more of an industrial based based style because that's also what I really enjoy. So I do see both sides, you know, I do think that you can, you can go both ways, honestly, but I just yeah. went down the, the more weekly based kind of content. And with that, again, it's just what you love. Um, you know, that whatever yeah. style best fits you, you should just roll with that. Um, mm -hmm. Cool, so uh, question from Sam, uh, very good general question, but it, it is good to think about. Where do you both <laughs> see yourself in a few years? Do you think you'll always want to do client work or move towards relying on other revenue streams such as YouTube content creation and you know bouncing off of that question um, if people start making this content is there a point where they can just start making money just off of the content and don't even need it to bring in leads don't need to do client work entirely what do you think well <laughs> it's a it's a hard question to answer you know I think for me at least I'm I'm creating products and I'm building I'm trying to build um, no code SaaS products where it would allow me to, to sort of create different revenue streams and not have to rely solely on on client based work even even if it is super lucrative and even if it is great to work with people i think i'm i'm at a point in my life in mentally where i just want to be able to build my own products do my own thing and have my own my own system you know do my own thing and the idea of being a freelancer is great at the end of the day but you are still technically working for others you are, you are, you are having to, to meet deadlines. You have to meet certain expectations. And it's really, I mean, the idea of not having to, to worry about any of that and just having this, this audience where you can, you can create videos that you really enjoy and you get paid for it and people really enjoy it as well. And supposedly you're helping them as well, because that's, that's also the entire point of the channel. All the videos are, are supposed to help others. You know, they're not just, me talking about my day and <laughs> and talking about all the things I like, you know, they're tutorials, they're things that, that help others. And there's, there's a part of that where it's really fulfilling, you know, you it's, it's the Ikagi or I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but uh, Chris Doe covered it once he said, or it's this, uh, I'm sure we're going to butcher this, but it's the thing that you love doing and the thing that you get paid for and then something that's charitable and then something that the world needs or something like something like that. And inside there is your passion, right? And for me, I feel like YouTube is a mix of all those things because it's something that I enjoy doing. It's something I get paid for it's, or can get paid for. It's something that helps others and it's something that the world needs. I'm sure the world doesn't need more Webflow designers, but here I am, you know, if you don't like me, then mm. you don't need to see me. You don't need to watch, but I feel like I'm helping others. I'm getting paid for it. Freelancing is great. 
but at the end of the day, you still need to to keep up with the pace of freelance. You still need to to wake up every morning and do certain amount of tasks, certain amount of this, check in on your designers, check on how this is doing, how that's doing. But I don't know. What do you what do you think? Because I'm also interested in hearing hearing your thoughts on this. Yeah, um, I'm really enjoying making YouTube videos. I also love working with clients. I have this pl problem right now where I have about three client projects on and I love them all, uh, but it means that mm -hmm. ma making videos isn't really a priority for me, even though I want it to be just because I have uh, a lot on. Um, and so as much as I love doing client work, it's also something that I'm probably going to slowly move away from uh, and you know get into more uh, of this kind of stuff, doing the content. Um, and, you know, obviously you have over six and a half thousand subscribers. So you must be making like, what, 10,000 a month now? Um, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling your leg, Can't you see? Buttons. Can't you see my, my Lamborghinis outside? <laughs> just, just waiting for me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, on that joke, like, uh, you know, people have to keep in mind that it's not a full time income until I don't know actually how many subscribers, 50,000, maybe 100,000. If that I'll, f I'll, f I'll figure it out when I get there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But either way, doing content has to be paired with something else in theory um, to make it a full time thing and, and kind of doing the half doing um, videos and half doing client work is a pretty good balance mm -hmm. uh, until you want to do something different. I know that Sam mm -hmm. does videos and courses. I think he also has a studio. Um, he can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so he obviously has a lot going on as well. I have no idea how yep. he balances it. Um, mm -hmm. But it is a balance and you just decide what is the balance that you want to do. Yeah, exactly. I think at the end of the day, it's 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 what it always is. You know, it's do you enjoy it? Which which one do you enjoy the most? And then go go after that. You know, if if YouTube turns out isn't what you like doing and it's not what what you it's not your calling, but it got you a few leads, it got you a few clients. Well, then there you go. I mean, that's you you fulfill you fulfilled the the reason for for making content. You know, but if what you enjoy is is creating a studio, creating an agency, doing it like a full team full in-house team, then why not? You know, if you can do it, if, if, if you're there, if you got the assets, if you got the people, then absolutely. Yep, definitely. Um, and so like for you, for example, perfect world, if, if you could just do the thing that you wanted to do, would it just be content? Would it be content plus X? Mm -hmm. I think in my, in my perfect world, it's a little bit of everything because I'm, I'm in a great spot in my life, you know, where I'm doing so many things that I really enjoy doing. There's nothing I'm doing that I don't like to do. And so it's it's almost like, it's like a good problem to have, you know, because I'm always doing something that I, that I enjoy doing, whether that's YouTube, whether that's, that's freelance, whether that's um, creating my own products, my own SaaS. In my ideal world, I would only be doing content and building my own products, creating my own line of products, and then have that be the Arnau Ross product line you know you got this you got that you got this you got that and being being able to to help others with those products i mean that's that's the other side of it right you're you're helping others you're you're not just doing this for yourself you know yeah definitely um all right so i have a big question here now maybe this isn't a big question for you uh have you okay. had any bad feedback <clears throat> kickback hate from people um if you have what does that look like does it bother you etc yeah uh, dude, I've had I've had a little bit of, of everything. You know, most of the comments, around ninety nine percent of them, are are super great. Or people just asking for for like a link or whatever. Like, it's always good content. It's always I mean good good comments. But I have had obviously uh, shitty questions <laughs> and people being being super mean, just like I hate yeah. your face <laughs> or whatever. And I'm just like, all right, dude. Like, okay, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to tell you. Like, how how do you how are you supposed to reply to that? You know, some people are just mean-hearted they're mean-spirited and that's just how they're how they're going to comment and that's it's not my fault and it's also not my problem so at the end of the day most most people are are, are great though most people are lovely um but yeah i mean how about you have you have you received any any bad comments any hate comments so far nothing majorly bad i was just going to bring up uh there was this <laughs> one kind of someone reached out to me um via my website and it was just really um quite rude <laughs> um and this was the, yeah. the first it's the one on the left and so i posted it on my instagram because i thought i was funny um that was like the first time i got really like feedback that kind of it hurt a little bit but um 
again, I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make this, um, kind of funny. Mm. And so I posted it. Um, there you go. Yeah. It, it happens so infrequently, even though it happens, but, um, when it does happen, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, again, yeah, you do just move on, um, kick it off. Cause yeah. when you grow a following, you're going to have an opinion and people are going to disagree uh, with that opinion. <laughs> um, cause there's no one. Has <laughs> alive. Thank you. Um, cause. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if, if you're getting hate comments, it means you're doing something right. Yeah, Unfortunately, you're doing as, something well. as, as, as shitty as that is, whenever you get hate comment, it means, it means you've, you've done something different. You've tried to be different. I don't know. You're trying to be, um, I guess I'm going to say the word different three times, but you're going to be different, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the alternative yeah. is just not really having opinion and just giving very, very basic um advice and, yeah. and everything and you can't you have to be you you have to have a specific way of talking yeah yeah i mean if, if people don't like the way I, I speak or the way i do my videos then it's as simple as not watching you know it's it's not that difficult yeah. i've i've never gone out of my way to comment something bad on someone's account or some someone's video or someone's instagram i don't know who does i don't know what what the thought process is there but people will <laughs> People will do it, and it's just, I mean, it's such a small thing that it shouldn't deter you from, from making content, honestly. Totally, totally. Uh, in terms of content, how long does it take you uh, to do this content on a weekly basis? What does that look like on a week-by-week -week basis? Yeah, so I have my, my long-term uh, freelance contract going. So I do have like a, a more stable work day, right, where I'm, where I'm doing YouTube, I'm doing freelance but that takes up like the big bulk of, of my week. And then yeah. I, I basically only do YouTube, like the content creation part on the weekends, right? So the weekends, I basically don't have a weekend. I do full work <laughs> on Monday to, to Friday. And then uh, Saturday, I'm planning the video. I'm making an outline if I do have to have one. I'm creating, up, I'm creating ideas. I'm looking at what other, other people are doing. I'm looking on, on Webflow, seeing if there's something cool that's new. And then Sunday, I sit down. I... Like you should, there, you should see my apartment. I mean, I live in a, in a, like a small-ish apartment, not, not the biggest thing in the world, you know, but I'm blessed. Um, but I basically have a little pull-out, um, a foldable table where I set it down and then I put my camera in front of me. I set up the lights, I set up the mic, I set up everything. And then I, I just record for like 10, 20, 30 minutes. Something, sometimes I need to redo it if it didn't come out the way I wanted to. And then I, I basically done, I ship it off to, um, to my editor, I thank thank God for my for my like mental health. I got an editor um, around six, seven, eight months in, or something something like that. But yeah, um, and to talk about it, one of the reasons why I got an editor was super interesting. I was in the middle of um, university in my, of my like finals, if you want to call it your finals, and balancing YouTube and balancing uh, other freelance content, freelance content, other freelance work that I was doing, and then also my final year of university, it was, just, it was just too much. And it was either, it was gonna be one or the other, right? It was, I had to let go of one of them. And I managed to find a great guy who could who could do the, the editing. And honestly, I haven't looked back since. It takes away so much mental mental space that I'm like, okay, I don't need, I don't need to worry about editing because I know that this dude is gonna, he's gonna hook me up. He's gonna do the Lord's work. And and yeah, that's, that's kind of the process in a nutshell. Totally. Um, one other good content uh, uh, comment question around this. Um, have you guys tried doing batch content creation? So for example, creating several videos, you know, in one mm -hmm. week and then just uh, planning that out, batching that, scheduling that um, down the weeks. Mm -hmm. um, have you tried that setup before? Yeah, obviously the, that's, that's the goal, right? Having, having batch content and not having to worry about the next few weeks. But yeah. what I, what I found is that, one of the one of the content one of the types of content that works really well on YouTube is things that are new, things that are that are trendy, things that are like up and coming, and that's what'll get you on browse, that's what'll get you in front of people's eyeballs. And you know, batching is great if I'm doing a like a, like a UI kit review or if I'm looking at something that's old. But then say Reloom comes out with their new Figma kit, well then the what I've batched would have had ready for, for two weeks doesn't doesn't count now because I need to get this video out because it's what will get eyeballs and it's what will do True. well. And in, in my mind, 
I'm like, okay, one day I'm just going to record 25 videos and I'll have half the year taken care of for YouTube. I'll just do that. But then it's not true. It's, it's just, it's impossible to do if, if yeah. you want to be on that trendy kind of, kind of vibe. But if you do want to make more tutorial based content, like, okay, like maybe, maybe like, like the work that you're, that you're creating, then it might make more sense to batch and it might make, might, might make things easier because I guarantee the way I'm doing it is not easy <laughs> and it's not, it's not for everyone. Yeah, I think in general, like uh, with videos and just basically anything, uh, if there is a way to batch, you should probably be batching. So um, yes. even just like checking emails is like the perfect example rather than having it open or kind of checking it, um, you know, all of the time, just checking it like, and I mean, this is the way that I think, uh, but I'm again at a pro. No, I agree. Uh, I agree with you. Hacker. I definitely agree with you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like just checking it definitely in agree the morning and in the mm -hmm. afternoon. Um, and doing that all at once. So I also try and batch, but again, the nature of what we're doing, it takes a, a long time to create these things. So it's a little bit, obviously, hard. Dude, it takes so long. It takes so long. And maybe it doesn't take long in terms of time, but it's so taxing on, on, your, on your head and mental. Yeah. And like, it's always like, there isn't a, a day in my life now where I'm not thinking about YouTube. I'm not thinking about the next video. I'm not thinking about the metrics. I'm not thinking about CTR and all these things. And that's just part of, of being a YouTuber or whatever, but I mean, it's fine, yeah. you know, but it, it, it all adds up. And if you can batch then definitely do it, but if not, then do it in the best way that that will allow you to stay consistent at the end of the day. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, uh, another thing I want to talk about is doing kind of YouTube alongside uh, other things, um, other mm -hmm. little side projects and stuff. Obviously, since we're creating content, we're also just creating stuff. Uh, there's something that um, you've kind of been working on or just started working on uh, mm -hmm. a kind of a, yep. a job board. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, guys, this is the, the first view of my of my job board. I haven't even released this to my audience yet. I haven't released it on my YouTube yet. You guys are getting a first peek of this, uh, of this job board. And so the idea here is this is a only Webflow based job board. And the idea is that if you're ever struggling on, on Webflow projects and you're struggling to find like where your next project is going to come from, then I recommend that you sign up to the Talent Collective, which is on the, the next tab if you want to click over there. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to become part of a collective where businesses can essentially pick who they want to work with. And it's a great way to to meet other designers. It's a great way to get consistent work. It's also, you can also be anonymous if you want to, but this is a great way to sort of build this, um, this consistent income, if you want to call it that, or this consistent workflow. And I feel like this is, this is extremely helpful to a lot of designers and a lot of workflowers because there's always people in my, in my DMs asking me, Hey, do you have any, any projects you want to outsource? Like, do you have any, any work that you might not want? And at the end of the day, this is supposed to, hopefully help people find find their next project. I hope that that helps you guys as well because when I was starting out it was a, it was a it was a pain, <laughs> it was a task to get to find a project and to to find to find work. And one of the one of the things about this is that it's also from like junior intern all the way down to to Webflow experts, right? It's it's everything in between. There's a few jobs on the job board already if you guys want to apply to those. Uh, and they range as well from intern all the way to to more to more product like you see there the first one from refocus it's junior some of them are remote some of them are remote eu us some of them are, are more local like the um the bots and people one but yeah there's hopefully this guys uh hopefully this this helps you guys um maybe nikolai can can put it down in the in the chat box put that link for you guys yeah cool and you guys can can join yep Definitely. And um, yeah, obviously, like it, it makes sense to have these tools and stuff alongside the YouTube so that you kind of have um, uh, other places or ways that uh, your audience can kind of um, either connect with you or just like follow on to do other things that are related um, to help them out. Like, you know, for example, Reloom, they post a couple of videos, they have some resources, and then they have this mm -hmm. uh, great tool that people can also use. Um, and so, same kind of thing. Yeah, uh, working on something uh, to help out. Your audience so yeah it's awesome man and you're i imagine you're going to be talking about this um kind of in upcoming videos exactly yeah i'm, I'm gonna i don't know when i'll, I'll release, release it to my 
to my audience, but I wanted you guys to get on it first. The VIP Nikolai squad. And oh, God. Yeah, ho hopefully oh, by the time God. that I release it, there's already a couple people on it, and, and you guys can, can start getting some, some clients. Totally. Uh, we have uh, five minutes left. Um, I, I, I guess I kind of have one other question that's kind of around sharing work, landing jobs, client work, all of this Let's realm, uh, which would to, to say that, okay, so I do this client project and now I've handed it off to them. Uh, rather than creating kind of tutorial videos on something that I did, uh, you know, for that client project or creating mm -hmm. a tutorial on how to improve a process, how might I be able to take that actual project and share that online? Yeah, well, that's, I feel that's a struggle with a lot of people, right? Like you always do really great work, but then it's covered by an NDA maybe, or exactly. it's covered by, yeah, by maybe the client doesn't want you to show your face and <laughs> tell people that, that you've, they've done the work. And sometimes your hands, your hands are tied by, by an NDA or just, just a verbal agreement, like, with your client, like, don't be a dickhead, you know, <laughs> if, if they don't want the work out there, then you shouldn't. But one of the things that you can do, and that I'm not even sure if, if, it, if it makes sense or not, but maybe I'm just off the top of my head is create the same project, except you change the images, you change the, the content that's on there, you make a more skimmed down version. And that kind of gets the point across to new inbounds, to, to new leads. And it shows the same structure, the same colors, the same idea, but maybe it's, you can't tell that it was for company A, company B, right? It's it's more of like a more of like a case study at that point. Yeah, that's that's definitely one option. Uh, I think it always makes mm -hmm. sense to reach out to the client, say, "Hey, you're okay with me uh, sharing this on certain channels?" And then mm -hmm. just clarify what what sharing looks like, whether that's just like an Instagram post or actually going in depth uh, in their website on like a YouTube uh, video. Yeah. So um, getting <laughs> clarification from the client always makes sense. Uh, but then obviously you have so many streams to share it on. You have Dribble that you can just take a snap or a video uh, of it. Um, there's Instagram more and more. I'm realizing that Instagram content is usually better when you're sharing um, some kind of helpful tips or resources rather than just your work. Yeah. That's something mm -hmm. that I'm really coming back on uh, more and more recently because I think I'm doing that wrong. Uh, obviously, portfolio, <laughs> having the, the kind of uh, project tile on the yeah. portfolio, um, getting on a chat, maybe asking the client if, it, if you can get on a chat with them and... Uh, yeah, and like at the, at the end of the day, yeah, like at the end of the day, if you're just a human being to your clients and you ask them, like, listen, this is a great, a great project that we did together. I think I'm really proud of the work that we did together. Um, would it be okay with you if I showed it? You know, I think this will help me get a lot of leads. I think it'll help me get on in front of a lot of people. There's there's probably no way that the client will be like, no, absolutely not. Like, you can't do this. You can't do exactly. that. Exactly. There's just no way. There's just no way. Maybe in terms of, of timing, he's like, okay, wait a few months. We want to get out there first. We want to be the first ones to, to do it. And then you can share your work in like three months, six months. Well, then you just wait. You just take, <laughs> you just take your time and, and post other things in the meantime. Definitely, yeah. And just before we wrap up, um, Leslie says, I think it also helps if you include a clause in the agreement that gives you permission to share the work once it's gone live or after handover. Mm -hmm. That's that's definitely true. That's totally an option. Um, a lot of mm -hmm. the time, like just, just saying or like asking the client, again, most clients are pretty chill. Um, and if the client maybe isn't so chill, then you probably don't want to be yeah. uh, sharing their work or like worrying about that anyway. Um, so totally an option to put it in your proposal uh, agreement clause etc um mm -hmm. or just chat with them and, and see to what extent they're happy to to share the stuff yeah mm -hmm. yeah i agree i agree with the comment definitely if you if you can get that in your clause get that in your contract um but sometimes clients will will read that and they'll see it as like a oh you try to slip this past me like <laughs> how dare you i'm never gonna trust you again you know and that's not what you want um but yeah, most of the times they'll be completely fine with it if you just if you just have a conversation and ask them. Uh, and he's saying that applies to big clients, corporates. Yeah, you're totally right. But bigger bigger companies do have slightly different rules, so um, I guess it is sometimes to it's better to actually put it in the uh, in the actual uh, documentation. Um, Omkar says he posted a reel on time lapse doing design on Figma and it got three k views in thirty minutes. <laughs> I mean, honestly, Instagram reels that's a good piece of content. <laughs> these yeah. uh, even YouTube shorts these like upcoming um, i guess they're not upcoming anymore are they 
Uh, these no. streams that people are using are massive, and if you enjoy using them, if you enjoy posting to them, these are the channels that mm -hmm. you should be doing because not many people, compared to YouTube or Instagram, uh, are doing them yet. Um, but you gotta, you gotta enjoy making them on a regular basis. I could never make TikTok content. Um, probably same with you. Nope. <laughs> same. I mean, I, so. I, it's something I definitely want to get more into, like near in the future, as I as I start doing less freelance work and I start focusing more on YouTube, I definitely want to focus more on more avenues, I have more time, obviously, so I can so I can do it. Um, but it's a different it's a different mentality. It's a different game. Like yep. the hearing hearing that that Omkar got three K views in, in thirty minutes, um, that's just like the the classic tale of, of Instagram and Reels. Like things just blow up out of nowhere and and you're just kind of asking if you can repeat it. And most of the time it'll be a resounding no, but then you try again and you try again and then 50 reels later, then then it blows up again. You know, like it's yeah. it's so hard to gauge on Instagram that, I mean, it's, it's just, you have to be consistent with it. Yeah, definitely. Well, very cool. It has been lovely uh, to chat with you, Arnau. Um, obviously you have YouTube channel, people can subscribe, um, find updates yep. uh, from there. Uh, how else can people reach out to you, find out about you, et cetera? Yeah, if you guys want to reach out to me, then definitely you can go on my Twitter, which is twitter.com.com. Just my username is Arno underscore design, which is always my socials. Um, you can also reach out to me on, on Instagram if you want to. I'm also on LinkedIn if you want to go that way. Uh, email me, hello at arnow.design if you really want to. But otherwise, yeah, I'm on Twitter. And can people reach out to your MySpace, your Club Penguin account? MySpace would be streams? a difficult one. You can send me a letter. <laughs> send, you send me a letter, of course. Of course, we'll put the full yeah. uh, address uh, in the description and times that <laughs> I usually go to sleep and wake up so people know. <laughs> Come visit me. <laughs> uh, and yeah. on, on that bombshell, we'll wrap up. It's been uh, lovely to talk to you, lovely to chat. I hope people have uh, learned a bunch and yep. uh, asked what they wanted to ask. So this has been lovely. Thank you so much, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cheers, mate.